You guys remember the interview with Joe Cooper about safety at sea? We talked about jack lines and PFDs and having a safety first mentality before you go to sea. You can see that one here. Today, Coop is back for a discussion about sails. We talk Dacron and laminates like carbon and Kevlar, reef points, and why full battens may or may not be what you want. So we got on the subject of sails. And right, right. That's a huge subject, very, uh, very wide and, and robust subject. Do you think Dacron is still king? Like, are we going to buy these 15, 20 year long Dacrons or, or are we beyond that in technology? Dacron, woven Dacron is still, from a business perspective, from the cloth manufacturers, is far and away the most commonly sold, so presumably commonly used, uh, sale cloth product. It's you know, relatively inexpensive. Um, it's durable, very viable in sunlight. It's virtually impervious to any of the usual commercial products that are used around boats for cleaning. Um, it's You're going to go a long way before you're going to see, you know, the charter firms using laminated product. So in that sense, for the average bear um, and perhaps the bulk of the practical sailor readership, um, you know, a boat under 35 or 40 feet, the recreational sailing, you know, on soundings, you know, within 100, 200 miles of your home port, you know, if you're up on the lakes and going somewhere or out here, you go up to Maine, um, you know, there has to be a lot of really good value to cover the price spread between a Dacron sale for, you know, we were just talking about your boat, a Dacron sale for your boat and some kind of laminated sale because the price spread is going to get you a little bit more performance out of the box, but it's going to diminish the overall durability, both the, uh, the mechanical structural durability of it and when that happens, the performance durability. So what I would suggest the, the readership or the viewership here is to consider, <clears throat> you know, you can get a Dacron sale for a thousand bucks or you can get the laminated version for 15 or 16 or 1700 bucks. So your cost on the margin, your opportunity on the margin is six or 700 bucks. What is that really going to buy you? And the you really settles in on one of the core aspects of the sale making business. Forget the carbon and the TP 52s and the America's cup and the computers and, you know, all of the whiz bang advertising at the end of the day, sale making is still a cottage industry. We find the customers, we consult with them. We find what they want to get done with their boats what they're looking to get done with the stuff they put on their boats we tell them what we, th we think is going to work we tell them how much it's going to be we measure it we design it we build it we deliver it a lot of the times we install it and a lot of the times we show them how to use it uh experiential you know mano a mano activity between a, a fella or a woman more actively more commonly these days looking to buy sales for their boat and the sales rep on the end of the phone. So um, that I think is where one of the biggest pieces of value can chip into that six or seven or 800 bucks on the margin, you know, the marginal cost there. I think that's a really important thing that you touched on there is it's not, this, these are not mass produced products. I can't just go on Amazon and order a sale from who knows where else in the world. Um, it's a very cottage industry and, I guess that leads me to the first thought that pops into my head is, well, if there's only a few people doing this on a very small scale, and I don't want to throw any manufacturers under the bus here, but do we see a wide variance in the quality that we get out of these independent sale makers? Uh, no, because sale makers have to work in a, you know, a commercial environment. And if your product isn't good, then you're not going to survive. You can't, it, you know, if you've got the stones to hang out a, a shingle that says Joe Cooper Sailmaker, 
I better be pretty damn making sure that what goes out the door is going to reflect what I think needs to go into the sale. It has to look good. It has to be well designed, the, the aerodynamics of it. It has to be well engineered. It has to be fabricated and look good from the artisan craft sense because sail making is still very, very, very hands on, you know, at a price that's competitive in the in the local market. Um, it has to be all of the things that a you know sole proprietorship, if you like, business has to present to their consumer face to make it viable so that they keep getting orders and they can keep opening the door on Monday morning. The, one of the big arguments I hear from both consumers, but largely from the guys in the sole proprietorship shops, is the attention to personal service. So talk to me about laminates then. I see them obviously in all the race boats. Um, why might I consider laminates and then why might I not consider them? The laminated sail is really a front for not really understanding what you have to know about what's in the laminate. It's a little bit like, do I take wheat or rye without considering the cheese and the roast beef or the ham and the so on and so forth, what's in it? So there are currently about seven or eight fibers from which something that we recognize as a sale can be made. It's polyester, um, uh, Vectran, Dyneema, Spectra, uh, a couple of the different Kevlar grandchildren, Aramids, uh, Technora, and Twiron, and then Carbon, so six. Okay, and nylon for spinnakers, but that doesn't count here. Um, and so really the question is, somebody says, well, you ought to have a laminated sail. You go, that's great. What's the fiber going to be? And the cost of the fiber go up, you know, more or less 45 degrees um, with the performance of the fiber. So the lowest performing fiber you can put in a laminated sail, and by extension, the least expensive, is polyester and the most expensive uh and the best performing is of course carbon <clears throat> so now you have the spread of six possible materials i really try to spend some time figuring out with them by interrogation q a what they're trying to do with the boat okay now you and i chatted a bit before we got going here and I don't know enough really about <clears throat> how you're going to use the boat to get on a bus about one fiber or one style of construction uh, versus another in your situation. The style of construction is um, a key part too because there's the fiber and then there's the way it's made, <clears throat> the way the product, finished product is made. So you can have woven, which is Dacron, of course, and then there's a laminate, and then there's the um, what I think most consumers would recognize as the string sails, the fiber path. But what you really need to come to grips with as the consumer, and the you know the consumer is an active player in this in this discussion. You know, you're not just sitting there told you need one of these. And you know, the one one thing that's really fantastic about sailors is they just love learning stuff. As I'm sure you guys at Practical Sailor know. They just love learning why something does this, that, or the other thing. And um, so mostly you can spend a lot of time educating the fellow on the phone about the different fibers and what they do and how they go together and you know, give them some options about what might work best for them. It, you'd be really hard pressed to convince a fellow with a, you know, a Catalina 30 or a Sabre 34 that he needs, a, you know, a, a spectral laminated roll up headsail if he's doing two club races a year. You know, he does the, the club's annual regatta, then he does the club's overnight, you know, from here to be out over to Block Island or something and then race back. You know, that to me, that would just be doing the fellow a disservice, I think. Can you talk to me about battens and sail shape and 
the, the use of the boat? I would regularly have folks call up and say, um, you know, I've got a, you know, a Sabre 38 and I want a full baton main and a 130 jib. And we talk for a bit and I go, so what, why do you want a full baton mainsail? They go, well, they're faster. And I would say, oh, really? How, how did you get to that? When did you read that? And there'd be silence for a minute, like I was an idiot. And he'd say, well, you know, they are, aren't they? And I said, well, maybe. Um, the question is, if they are faster, then what is, again, going back to the value issue and the consulting and the, I like to think of it as being on the same side of the table as the, the guy on the phone, all right? Um, how much faster do you think it's going to be with full battens than not full battens? And is that estimation of speed increase going to be justified by the extra cost of the full length battens? And in a situation you describe, which happens with a lot of the older, but the older Pearsons and Bristol's have the same kind of track. Um, the ease slash difficulty of handling the mainsail. You know, you and me are the only two guys on the planet that go to the mast to pull a sail up these days. And the other aspect of the full link patents is that the advertising, the sail makers in the advertising, that whole sort of corporate triumvirate have convinced people that full length battens make the sale easier to deal with. Maybe there is, there has become the sale community has inured the consumer into thinking that the full length baton is the be all and end all of performance and ease of handling. Well, it ain't, <laughs> you know, I guess on that vein, does having a full length baton in any way increase the longevity of the sale? Well, so there's there's several items that you can put under the positive column of full length battens. And yes, that is one of them. Um, you will know, of course, that when you have conventional battens, the frequency of the flogging is much higher. And that um, in the fiber side of sail making that's known as flex because the things go backwards and forwards they flex like the wire coat hanger trick right um and particularly with older sails with older style of battens the the ones that look like a you know a meter a yard stick from the hardware store uh, you know an inch thick and they're constant camber all the way through and so they create a crease at the front end of the batten pocket and that is both a wear point for damage and also it's a bump in the sail shape. So it's kind of ugly. Um, so yes, the, the durability aspect with a caveat, the durability aspect of a full batten sail in terms of flogging, the full battens are a plus side. You touched on reef points. Um, are, is sort of industry standard to put two in there or are people often requesting three? Well, in the days when um, I would get um, RFQs off the website, there would be no reference to reefs, or sometimes the, bit, the field in the inquiry form on the screen would be checked for two or one. So you sort of look at that and you go, well, okay. And then you look at the boat. You know, it's a Catalina 30. Does a Catalina 30 really need two reefs? You know, where's he sailing? San Francisco Bay? Yeah, maybe. Long Island Sound? Yeah, probably not. Um, you know, a guy with a, you know, Swan 47 going around the world? Well, okay, let's have the discussion here. But the answer to the question is, once again, what's the guy doing or the girl? What are the, what are the folks doing? What's the boat? Where are they going? How are they sailing it? You know, kind of what's the budget? Are they, if they're going offshore, do we have the discussion about two or three reefs or two and a trisol? And that comes up more frequently than you would think, um, even today. I mean, you don't you don't see the boats, you know, the the 
around the world boats, the, the, the ocean race, I keep wanting to call it the car company race, <laughs> uh, the ocean race, and just recently the uh, Global Solo Challenge at a girl call. You don't see people, you don't see footage off the boats or pictures of those boats with storm trysails, even when it's blowing 50. So in that sense, sort of like the full-length battens and the carbon sails, the public has been acclimated to the fact that and in newer sailors, that storm trysails, you know, what's a storm trysail? They don't exist, it, you know, in the in the psyche. The discussion there is, um, do you have three reef points or do you have two and you displace the reefs in the sail so that the sec by the time you have the second reef in, it's pretty close to a reduction equal to three reefs if – you had three reefs. Yeah, I've never understood entirely reef points and a roller furling jib or a, or a furling head sail of any kind. But I understand that 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 technology exists where the sail maker will definitively say, here are the positions that the head sail should be in um, for whatever reason to be reefed. Is that something that we're still seeing or can you tell me what that is? So the reefs in a roller furling head sail, so there's the difference between a roller furling and a roller reefing head sail. Invariably, the reefing in the head sail is sort of focused on the older boats that have were designed with overlapping head sails, you know, from the IOR and IMS days. Um, the original setup was when Ted first invented the, the rollers, the roller reefing, roller furling, when you we've all seen pictures of the sail rolled up and it looks awful. It gets deep and it's got crinkles coming out of the head and the tack. Um, what's happened over the years is sail makers have figured out how to catch up with the consumers who wanted didn't want to go to the bow and change sails and practically couldn't with the roller furlers. Um, and so we put some kind of device in the lap of the sail that takes out the depth in the sail too. If you look at the pictures of the non device in the lap, they're really deep. And crinkly, the sails with the foam or the rope in the luff are uh, actually look pretty reasonable if they're not rolled up too much. The reef point marks on the foot of the sail, they're kind of nominal. They're something like 10 or 15 to 20% of the foot length after the tack. And it is as much a suggestion as to where to put the sail so that you can then move the general cars to the equally marked place so that the sail will set properly. I remember last time we talked, you had some Cooperisms that you used. I wonder if you have any top three, top five ways that we can make our brand new sails last that whole, you know, 15 or 20 years that we hope that they'll last. Wait, how do I keep, how do I take care of this thing? On the basis of my mother would smack me if I didn't be straight up with you, I think the 15 to 20 year cycle is out there with the Model T Ford. Um, I think it's better to look at your sale, uh, your sales lifespan in terms of, you know, starting with hours like the J24s and the TP52s or days or weeks or years. Uh, well, the years, you, what happens is the sail doesn't degrade over years, it degrades over hours of use. Um, the, the gold standard for having a sail not structurally fail uh, over time is of course the woven Dacron. Um, I think you're misguided if you think you're gonna have a laminated sail that's gonna go 15 years. The things that will degrade your sail are flapping, flogging, um, wearing on something, so chafe, so the mainsail on the on the rigging, um, headsails, overlapping headsails on the spreaders. So, you know, you really need to be cognizant of having spreader patches on it. Um, also, for boats that have um, radar, radar domes or radar reflectors, or very prominent uh, light housings, you know, the foredeck light, the steaming light uh, on the front of the mast, uh, or a, a staysail tang, 
uh, you know, the nose cone comes out for the staysail and there's a stay on it and you pull it out of the way, but the nose cone's still there. Um, I have put patches on headsails, uh, measured for patches on headsails to accommodate all of that stuff. The connection of the lifelines to the front rail, the bow rail, mm, there's, there's a reason to put something over the foot of the sail there. So I get the guys to put a four-inch Dacron tape over the foot of it so it's it's uh you know sacrificial that that chase through and then somebody can replace it somewhere down the line you should pay attention to getting the salt off the sails every once in a while the washing the standard washing is not to make the sails clean and fluffy like you should but it is to get the salt off the sail and the salt away from the metal parts and the in the sail corners Cotter pins, split pins, sharp edges on anything. I'm told that Rod Stevens had a trick that he used to uh, engage when he was commissioning a new boat. And he would take a piece of, um, I think in the book it's referred to as nylon hose, so stockings, pantyhose, I guess, these days. And he would walk around the boat with it and he would drag it. All around the boat, up the mast, along the boom, along the deck, along the fence, and anywhere that got snagged on the nylons, he would mark, and then they'd go back and they'd look at it. Try to talk to sailmakers and get a sense of somebody that can sit on your side of the table. And and again, this is just me, but you're spending so much money on these things. You know, a, a set of sails for a forty footer is the price of the engine okay and the engine gets hopefully way more care than the sails do <laughs> okay you change the oil and you clean all the dust off it and you change the belts and all the rest of it and the sails are sort of like oh we pull the sails up and we go sailing and we pull them down and we go home well okay that's sort of the lot of sails but because it's such there's such complexity in the product, the individual product, what size slides fit in the thing? Do you really need full-length battens? Um, how much roach goes on the sail? So ask questions. Yeah. I I tell my kids in sailing, the high school team, when the, the new kids come in, <clears throat> and I ask them to go do something, and you can see them sort of hesitate and look at that and look at me and look at the other kids. And then I took them in and say, I got, a, I got a silly question, and I go, stop. There is no such thing as a silly question around a boat. You don't know what I'm asking you to do or, or you're not sure. You go, hey, what are you talking about? I'm not, I, you know, talk to me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. So talk to me like I'm a freshman in high school. Sales, you really can't go sailing without sales. And they are a complex proposition. They take, as you can see, they take an awful lot of time to talk about. Um, they're expensive for all their robustness. They are kind of delicate. You know, you don't want to drag the sail over the lifelines and the stanchions onto the dock. You kind of want to pick it up. Um, they're expensive and you want to try and make them last structurally and performance wise as long as you can, uh, before you go again. Because, and it, it behooves the sale companies and so the sales reps to really be on your side. You know, you're giving them, you know, you're giving us money to go build you something, but it's really in our best interests that you get the best value out of it because, you know, you take up, give up the boat and go skydiving. We all got to go get a real job. I don't want to do that. I'm too old for that. <laughs> so. Um, that's Scuba's wisdom for sales. Thank you so much for watching. Please take a second to give this video a thumbs up. It helps a lot. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And leave a comment below. Which sales do you run and why? What would you like to see in future videos from Practical Sailor? We'll see you all next time.